Hello, I'm Alon. And I'm Daniel. And together we practice as cooking sections. And this is when salmon, salmon, salmon. Oranges require orange to be. They are a color expectation. If an orange is not orange, it is no orange. Oranges originated in China, where they were absorbed from and crossbred from a mandarin and pomelo as early as the 4th century before Christ. From there, oranges passed from Sanskrit through Persian and its Arabic derivatives, traveling with the Moors, Naranjas, Sundote de Andalus, and Sicily. Oranges arrived in England from France in the 14th century, their bright skins holding a taste of a color that became popular in markets, on palates, and eventually in tongue. For centuries, oranges were orange, and still orange was not a color. It was called yellow-red. It took another 200 years for the color to earn its name, to become a form that could give itself to others, to be ascribed to flowers, stones, minerals, and the setting sun. To the west, oranges followed the path of Spanish missionaries to America and led their name to Orange County and the Orange State. In California, the fruit fed the miners of the gold rush who passed through mission towns. In Florida, there were so many groves that by 1893, the state was producing 5 million boxes of fruit each year. In this tropical climate, nights too humid and too hot, oranges would ripen too quickly. They were ready to be eaten while still green. And so, from the 20th century onwards, green oranges have been synthetically dyed orange, coated to match consumer expectations. Oranges reveal that humans cannot imagine a species detached from its color, even when we are the ones who detach it. This is the origin story of what Ai Hisano calls the capitalism of the senses. The management of food color as a business practice often invisible to consumers in order to correct natural variations. As she remarks, the color of food is not merely a physiological characteristic but a contested terrain where nature and technology intersect. Businesses in business interests, government regulations and consumer expectations compete and taste and sight are entwined. Amid all the observations that are made about industrialization and its consequences, the following is rarely heard. The world's colors are shifting. We grow up coloring in pictures of the world, trees are green, oceans blue, and yolks yellow. That everything else in life is turned regularly upside down is only tolerable because oranges remain orange and the sky remains blue. An increasing amount of industrial energy is directed, therefore, towards dyeing the world in natural colors so that life and commerce may proceed. But dyes may miss their mark. Shifting cues in flesh, scales, skin, leaves, wings, and feathers are clues to the environmental and metabolic metamorphosis around and inside us. The force that is color is not for domestication. It is fugitive. Color colors outside our lines. As Esther Leslie puts it, color is fragile and contingent. Color is fleeting fugitive, unstable, more attuned to the memory than to the objective world, always escaping or seeing seeping away, fading as night falls or when the sun shines too brightly. Chemists struggle to make it last. Color is motile. And in the realm of, realm of color, chemical color, synthetic color, nothing remains the same as it was yesterday. In 2018, an eye-catching sparrow was spotted in the Isle of Skye, Scotland. The sparrow was bright pink. We know what sparrows are supposed to look like, because we have evolved, they have evolved with us. Over several millennia, food scraps from human settlements attracted sparrows from the wild, which mutated into a new species. How sparrows have since become a familiar sight wherever humans dwell. They metabolize the shades of our settlements into their brown-gray feathers. They are drabber than their older tree sparrow cousins who preserve the brighter tones of the forest. 
The pink sparrow, neither forest nor house, was a color leak. The sparrow had turned salmon. Salmon are at home in color. Whipping her tail, a female salmon spent two days making a depression in the riverbed called the red, where she deposits her eggs. Fertilize these red spheres of nutrients in case young salmon who eat their way out, taking the color inside. Once the eggs are depleted, salmon swim to the ocean in search of food. There, they feed on red-pink crustaceans, mostly shrimp and krill, as well as small fish and even smaller crustaceans in their digestive system. From these, they absorb yellow, red, orange fat-soluble pigments called car carotenoids, the tint salmon, salmon. Salmon record their location by metabolizing these shades. Their flesh is color coordinated with their journey. If salmon could peer inside their own bodies, they could distinguish from their muscle tones, the Trondheim Fjord from Sky or the Bering Sea. When salmon are ready to breed, they stop eating. Their stomachs shrink to the size of a finger to make room for roe and milt, and they are drawn back to their birthplace, searching for home against the current. The swim upstream requires such great exertion that it pushes red pigment to the surface of a salmon's skin, a sign of health that lures mates. Female salmon pass on carotenoids in their flesh to plump their roe and make it attractive to prospective males. Color streams through generations linking salmon to their red. Salmon color is the pathway both metabolic and geographic of being. It is the atmosphere in which salmon are born and die. Color in this cosmos then is more than cosmetic. It is a biological influence as strong as memory. Salmon is a means by which color moves according to the logic of ingestion. Salmon metabolize their color, literally drawing life from it, and humans craving this color, species consume an image of health. Such is the human um, thought of salmon, scales encased in ink-perfect pink flesh, a river leaping with fish on the run, a color bound to a body, and a body bound to its own name. On the Isle of Skye, however, this pictorial logic is fading. Sky no longer runs salmon. Populations have fallen to historic lows and corporate aquaculture has filled the waters around the island with intensive open net salmon farms. Salmon then, the color and the fish, is a red herring. Open net fish farms are flow through feedlots. Enclosed in pens with one to 200,000 other fish, a salmon cannot feed on krill and shrimp. Here, a salmon is naturally deprived of astaxanthin, the carotenoid that makes crustacean pink and protects its body from solar radiation and stress. A salmon's color reflects its well-being. Darker pink salmon represents access to astaxanthin-rich crustaceans, whereas pale pink salmon represents a lack of nutrients or high stress levels. Farm salmon lacking these resources are no longer truly salmon. Their flesh tone is no, now closer to white gray than red. Salmon the fish are cleared of salmon the color. Pigmentation in farmed salmon also profits from being photo manipulated. Consumer demand makes and requires fish all year round. And so many farms in northern latitudes mask the seasons through artificial light. Fluorescence mimicking <clears throat> summer sunshine are turned on and off. On and off. On and off. On and off. And on and off. Most salmon do not know seasonal darkness in their brief 18 months of captive life before slaughter. 100,000 lumen bulbs are in an ingredient in a lighting recipe that creates unseasonal, summer-like atmospheres. For farmed salmon, a year might have two summers skipping a winter. Salmon is perhaps the only animal to have been domesticated on a global scale within our lifetime. As Alex Blanchett notes in Porcopolis, waves upon waves of industrialization have been compounded into farmed animal bodies over time, 
and there is nothing familiar or stable about the emerging result. Under the weight of accelerated growth, farmed salmon spines curve, eyes wrap, tails shorten, and jaws bend. More than 90% of farmed fish can indeed be considered deformed. Fused and compressed vertebra twist bodies to such an extent that salmon struggle to swim. The technology and labor that are needed to keep these industrially farmed animals alive for optimal profit, Blanchett continues, shape bodies without remaking nature in service to human flourishing. Far worse, they leave behind unruly polluted and toxic environments. Parasites like sea lice thrive on salmon bodies when they are cramped into the confines of the pen, easily multiplying as they jump between hosts. These parasites feed on the skin and blood of farmed salmon, causing lesions, stress, and in some cases killing entire populations. The lesions, which make fish aesthetically unappealing and unmarketable, are the biggest problem for farms. Increasingly, poisonous toxins to fight disease and parasites are added to feed and also metabolized into flesh. And when chemicals are ineffective, salmon are just splashed with boiling water over short periods of time to detach the lice. This is of course an imprecise method, and in 2016 over 175,000 Scottish salmon were boiled alive during a not uncommon accident. Another way to target parasites is through the use of laser beam. These optical Delausian devices go on and off, on and off, on and off, and on and off. The farm's light regime is therefore a paradox. As growing seasons extend and fish multiply, parasites thrive, and more light enters the fray. Light, necessitated light necessitates light to keep up with market speed. Salmon summer is the season for cataracts. Warm water temperatures fog the lenses of fish eyes, and usually salmon swim deeper to escape the heat, but in farms there is nowhere to go. In this salmon world, most fish are blind and partially deaf which at least may reduce the stress of living with the noisy light systems, heaters and sealed deterrents of the farm. Hundreds of kilos of feed particles and antibiotics, which are distributed through hyper-efficient automated feeders that detect when the fish are hungry, billow out into the surrounding water. Clouds of fish excrement sink and blanket the seafloor, stiffening oxygen and creating uninhabitable dead zones. Chemical runoff from these toxic toilets leads to disease and mutations in surrounding fit populations. Salmon farms are now dotted the coasts of Scotland, Iceland, Chile, Ireland, Canada and Tasmania, but they are also affected the waters of lands and other countries from South America to West Africa. Trawlers off the coast of Peru or Senegal, which sustainably source an anchovies for feed pellets, are depleting local fish populations. These anchovies are mixed with soy protein from Brazil's Cerrado tropical savanna, which is being cleared for a farmland at the rate 50% faster than the Amazon. When the Scottish clearances happened some 200 years ago, Thousands of Gale people were dispossessed, evicted from their villages and banned from living off the land as they used to. Sheep became more valuable than people. Today, salmon farming corporations are replicating a similar process by clearing the seabed as more and more dead zones are appearing all around salmon farms. This new wave of oceanic clearances is a multi-billion business for a few but invisible to humans above water. Salmon is much more than what meets the eye. As Elizabeth Lian claims, salmon are bred to be hungry. Their job is to put on weight at any cost. What's more, we should rather consider the act of feeding salmon as a landscape consuming practice at a planetary level. As a global commodity, farmed salmon defies any attempt to be pinned down to any particular geography. Scottish salmon today does not entirely come from Scotland. Salmon hatching roe is part of an intricate transnational circulation of precious genes 
color pigments and eggs fertilized and incubated in different facilities <clears throat> and ready to be sent from farming sites to farming sites across the world. Therefore, Scottish salmon today is neither, <clears throat> sorry, neither entirely Scottish nor is it wholly salmon. An inventive marketing around the origins and quality of farmed salmon has emerged in the UK. The Scottish Salmon Company has branded themselves as purveyors of authentically Scottish salmon. Despite being registered in Jersey, owned by a Swiss bank with Ukrainian and Norwegian investors, floated on the Oslo Stock Exchange and used imported Norwegian genetic material for their farmed salmon. Greek seafood Shetland sources salmon from the wild waters of Shetland, but wild here refers to the water and not the fish itself. It is no surprise that Marks & Spencer salmon brand name is Loch Muir. Indeed, a Scottish wilderness sounding name, <clears throat> but Loch Muir is a place that does not exist on the map. Aldi promotes Best of Scotland salmon with an image of a fishing boat when it is actually farmed in Norway and the Faroe Islands. Morrison's promotes Catch of the Day salmon, which is sourced from farms in Norway, and Scottish quality salmon, which is farmed in Norway, but only smoked in Scotland. Scottish salmon has become a brand that needs to be critically rethought, not only from an environmental and ecological perspective, but also questioning what Scottish and salmon mean in that construction. Salmon is a species cleared of its metabolic processes that constitute salmon, both colour and fish. It is our desire for colour which eventually landscapes the environment. In natural habitats, animals use colour to attract, warn or camouflage, soulful social functions of an ecosystem. In captivity, where mating is replaced by artificial insemination, be and predators by this disassembly lines, most color fades. Yet to the human eye, a body without color is nobody. So if a food lacks color, or the body lacks the food that contains its color, then the body needs to be color fed. The equation feed conversion ratio is a tool to quantify the success of farmed salmon. It indicates the precise quantity of feed pellets around three kilo that equate to biomass gain around one kilo. And that is the efficiency ratio by which feed is best converted into food and color. These animals, which are neither beings nor objects, are the synthesis of ecology and economy. Living matter becomes a dislocated liquid volume cascading through planetary pipes that connect oceans with disassembly lines, mills and packing facilities. Chicken are fed ground up fish, fish are fed ground up chicken, and pigs and fish are fed ground up fish. Millions of tons of animal travel the world as animal feed, and in every step, color additives supplement the food deficiencies of each industrialized species, coloring the flesh that flesh ingests. Feed is not just food, whether for humans or animals. It is a logistical operation that transfers matter from place to place and body to body. Dying and digesting bodies become color machines that process and propagate images of their wilderness, the fashioning of which they no longer control. The pink sparrow in the sky, neither forest nor house, appeared at the end of one of these voracious food chains. Its salmon feathers were color leak, a sign. In farms, the color salmon leaves outside the fish. Grey salmon must be fed an imitation of their natural color, and farmers, but farmers cannot afford to feed salmon, krill or baby lobsters. And so, since the 1970s, Synthetic astaxanthin has been used to stain salmon in multiple pantones of salmon. At once grey and pink, they are salmon. 15 hues classify salmon following 15 pantone shades. 
You are looking at Pantone 1555U. Are looking at Pantone 1565U. Are looking at Pantone 1625U. Looking at Pantone 1635U. Are looking at Pantone 1575U. Are looking at Pantone 487. Are looking at Pantone 486U. Are looking at Pantone 1645U. Are looking at Pantone 157. Are looking at Pantone 1655U. Are looking at Pantone 158. Are looking at Pantone 1665U. Are looking at Pantone 485. Are looking at Pantone 2347. Are looking at Pantone 2028. You are looking at the 15 Pantones of Salmon. The Salmon Fan trademark is a universal system used by the salmon industry to apply synthetic salmon tones to fish. Darker hued salmon fed more as the something are more expensive than lighter shades, while salmon lower than 23 on the scale are difficult to sell at any price. The salmon palette was invented by Hoffman La Roche after decades of producing food coloring and medicines derived from petrochemicals, La Roche took special interest in synthetic astaxanthin in the 1990s. Their salmon scale allows salmon farms to decide on the precise amount of astaxanthin to feed the fish according to the tastes of their market. In 2002, La Roche sold Samofan together with their vitamins and fine chemicals division to Dutch state mines that was originally set up as a coal mining enterprise. And today, DSM markets synthetic carotenoids as nutritional products for salmon and shrimp under the, the, the trade name Carophile Pink. Human tastes with their eyes just as much as their tongue, and in DSM own words, Color is essential to the sensory perception of quality. Salmon, the color, the flesh, the fish, the system, is an image produced by and dependent on generic geographies. We paint the world in colors we expect to see, and in doing so, we color our expectations. Yet salmon struggle to achieve the perfect salmon, salmon that consumers demand in their flesh even with the aids of synthetic coloring. Their color is affected by their level of anxiety, exhaustion, and crowd crowding in the farm. These stresses create their given color by reducing their metabolization of astaxanthin. Homogeneity in color amongst farmed salmon, even in the same farm, is almost impossible, and so faulty colors appear. At time of slaughter, 10 to 30% of salmon have black spots in their muscle fillets, a sign of tissue damage. No one wants to eat fish colored with polka dots, and so they are discarded. Color is all that matters. The salmon sparrow in the sky was a warning signal of this very possibility. A body consumed by the color of another species, a red flag. In 1856, William Perkins was trying to synthesize quinine as a treatment for malaria. In the process, he accidentally isolated Moab from coal tar, unleashing the colors held fast in the sludge of energy. Little did he know, this would come to be called aniline, and would be the base of a synthetic color revolution, as well as the origins of almost all chemical and pharmaceutical companies. Turning coal tar into color was far more rewarding than any alchemist could have dreamt, providing the means by which the world could be completely repainted. Coal tar's darkness, as Sir Esley, Leslie claims, was the origin of a color rush. The rainbow could be extracted from the mine rather than the colony, and a seemingly new world order began in which pigment took hold at the molecular level. The color industry itself reached its explorative heights in Nazi Germany when ACFA, BASF, Bayer and other coal derivative companies consolidated into IG Farben, and Farben meaning colors in German. Instrumental to and the instrument of Hitler's regime, IG Farben created everything from dyes to paints to food colorings. Using slave labor, labor from concentration camps, it revolutionized the standardization and commodification of color while also manufacturing Cyclone B, the deadly poison of the gas chambers. Since the advent of industrialism, color has been moving. 
It fades and it is fed, but it also morphs and changes, signaling environmental shifts. The most famous interspecies toxic class struggle of the 19th century is that of the moth. As factories rose between London and Manchester, both town and country darkened. Walls and streets were blackened, and while lichen on the bark of trees they, on which the moth lurked faded, the moth themselves darkened. Formerly camouflaged, they became easy prey, and a rarer kind of moth with black spots of melanin took their niche. By 1848, Fully black specimens had become a common enough sight in Manchester that they were classified as their own species. Opposed to the white-bodied typica, the normal, the black-bodied moth was named Carbonaria, as if carried by the billowing plumes of chimneys and smokestacks, carbon gave itself to another form, animating carbon colour, and by the end of the century, Carbonaria almost twice outnumbered Typica. The struggle of the prepared moth signaled an ecochemical crisis. The moth mothed into atmospheric pollution. Industrialism, an unpre unprecedented release of energy into the new system, classifies. It counts, groups, and naturalizes differences that emerge as environments transform. Classification depicts the new in the context of the existing. It domesticates and depoliticizes the struggle of adaptation. Like wilderness, it organizes life into a static image. The irony is we cannot imagine the species removed from its color because we taxonomize, at least at first, visually. Like moths, moth in moth, Pigeons with darker feathers are now reproducing faster than their lighter fellows. They pigeon, pigeon. Melanin is pigment and protection, drawing the ions of toxic trace metals from their bodies to their pinion. Zinc, and sometimes lead, deposited in their wings, color coordinates them with their urban environment. Even after death, birds keep atmospheric toxins in their own feathers and we can read the composition of urban air in the way feathers feather toxin. Ornithologists along the east coast of the US have noticed that some yellow feathered birds have begun to molt crimson. Like the salmon sparrow on sky, their body color and their species color no longer align. As temperatures rise in the area, plant life has adapted and red honeysuckle berries now proliferate. When woodpeckers and waxwings feed on this once uncommon fruit, they metabolize rhododendron, a red pigment that alters the color of their feathers. When yellow woodpeckers feather invasive berry, we can tell that berries are turning rising temperatures. Color then no longer flows through bodies, but rather bodies are flowing through color. In our post-industrial era, the amount of toxic substances circulating through bodies is such, Hannah Landecker notes, that bodies are actually the ones circulating through chemicals and not the other way around. Likewise, instead of bodies metabolizing color, it appears color is metabolizing bodies. A bright pink foam of lead, cadmium, nickel and mercury runs into India's Yamuna River from textile factories. This runoff leaches into the soil, warming up roots and making the vegetables that grow in fields nearby taste fast fashion. Fast fashion flows from the river to the plants to the textile workers who eat them and back out again. In Mumbai, fast fashion metabolized 11 dog bodies, strays who swam in the Kasadi River to cool down amidst the summer heat and then turn cyan blue. As low-cost fast fashion producers concentrate their facilities in countries with cheap labor and lax environmental regulations, um, the, the, the rivers also start tra running trendy seasonal colors. And so the dogs that swim in must wear color rivers become must wear color dogs. Red Hook in Brooklyn had an incredibly hot summer in 2010. Flowers and blossoms withered, and hives in the area began to glow incandescent red. 
it seemed that starving bees had resorted to non-floral food sources. As the Brooklyn bees fed on cherry syrup from a nearby factory, red number 40 petrochemical colorant metabolized bees, honey, and a hive. At the ends of the earth, chromatmospheres show signs of a new bipolar order. In the Arctic, air losing transparency due to suspended chemicals distorting the trajectory of sunlight is a snow. Ocean water pollutants accumulated in fat erodes the skin of white seals, causing fading. What seems like orange snow rust is actually parasites thriving in rising polar temperatures. The Arctic does not Arctic, Arctic white any longer. In the Antarctic, the snow is pink, but less so than before. Adeline penguin poo turns pink as the result of the penguins feeding on astaxanthin rich creel. But as creel overfishing diminishes this part of their diet, penguin colonies are losing their characteristic tone. The snow remains plain white even after penguin droppings are deposited on its surface, and their migration can no longer be color traced from above. In the Antarctic, it snows salmon. Flamingos raised in captivity lack access to astaxanthin rich algae, so zoos feed them flamingo to keep up with visitor expectations. Just as farmed salmon, 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 flamingo, flamingos, flamingo. In the meantime, the algae that gives flamingos their distinctive salmon color are the latest wonder ingredient in human beauty products and you can now flamingo your skin, hair and nails. Our skin biologically protects us while also exposing us to the politics of perception, shifting with the popularity and decay of skin bleaching and tanning products. The perception of skin tones have changed over time, showing the unstable relationship between class and race, as well as the human obsession with bodily appearance. Tanning gummy bears allow now light-skinned humans to metabolize the color of the sun without sitting under it. They are just one another wave of food supplements to alter skin from the inside out. Bodies have become filtering devices. Humans and animals are disposable hosts for synthetic color. Humans struggle to imagine a species detached from its color even when we are the ones who detach it. Shifting cues in flesh, scales, skin and feathers are clues to the metabolic metamorphosis around and inside us. Life in the chromatmosphere denies salmon the right to their own colors. As diets and desires transform plant and animal bodies, we need to learn the struggle of living with and within color. After all, we color the chromatmosphere and the world is already saturated. Salmon is the color of a wild fish that is neither wild, nor fish, nor even salmon. After decades of overfishing, exhaustive salmon farming and color leaks, Sky's waters have reached a point where seasonal productivity, ecology and employment need to be rethought. Food seasons, as we know them, have ceased to exist. In a supermarket, you can find strawberries, tomato, plums or even salmon filling the shelves all year round. You have all seasons. Beyond this flattened, continuous 365 day long seasons, what would be the new periods we could eat according to today? If humans have been changing environments, how can we also change our food systems to adapt to them and build other forms of landscape? Climavore explores how to eat as humans change the climate, a form of devouring that follows the consequences of anthropogenic landscapes affected by intensive forms of extraction. Different from carnivore, omnivore, locavore, vegetarian or vegan dishes, it is not so much the ingredients that define climavore, but rather the infrastructural responses to human-induced climatic events. New seasons of food production and consumption have begun to appear. 
Climavor aims to rethink the environmental futures of coastal inhabitation and the coastal commons through a diet that can effectively transform desires and infrastructure. In the case of polluted shores by salmon farms, it takes the tidal zone as an ambiguous site that appears, disappears, reappears, and constantly changes in sight. In the words of Bonnie McKay, the littoral must be kept as a liminal zone. Coastal space has no clear definition and opens up for murky yet cleaner usership, and can become today the entrance into a new ecology, economy and imaginary. Other understandings of aquacultures in sky and its tidal zones can become a site of opportunity for more sensitive practices along the tidal commons. Human-induced climatic alterations of the waters, ranging from increasing acidification of the ocean, appearance of new parasites and disappearance of species, need to be rethought through other forms of eating and sourcing of nutrients that challenge the inherent structures that transform agribusiness or in this specific case, aquaculture, landscapes. Um, Elizabeth Hoover's account of the ways Mohawk communities along the St. Lawrence River are continuously exposed to, in, to and ingest and metabolize PCBs highlights how these moments of metabolic friction can become a catalyst for a new metabolic order. Different from intensive salmon farming that produce an access of nitrogen, other creatures do opposite processes. They clean the water by breathing. So do other filter feeder bivalves like clams, scallops, razor clams, barnacles, and seaweeds. And like them, kelp, sea lettuce, or dos. They all provide an incredible source of nutrient of easy axi protein without any need for feed or fertilizers. Despite having lost connection today to some of these ingredients, they were abundant and used by both humans and animals. There are archaeological remains of prehistoric sheep in Scotland with marks in their teeth that indicate a kelp-based diet. And even in the modern times, a booming industry in Skype emerged for kelp-based explosives during the Napoleonic War in the 1820s. After sourcing oysters from naturally occurring beds, it was later discovered that they could be grown in oyster tables. Structures going hundreds of meters into the sea, where oysters are washed by the tides following moon cycles. On the Isle of Skye, uh, our oyster table also functions like uh, a dining table and follows um, the different um, discussions around aquacultures that could happen. Every day at high tide, the structure allows its oysters, mussels and seaweeds to breathe one oyster can filter up to 120 litres of seawater per day. At low tide, the oyster table emerges above the sea and functions as a dining table, where we place some humans. Over breakfast, lunch or dinner, according to the tides, performative meals feature a series of climavore ingredients, where workshops with fishermen, politicians, residents and scientists have been held to discuss another cultural imaginary for the island. Guests enjoyed bloody oyster cocktails crunchy shingles or lasagna for, for, for sure, amongst many other climavore delights. Aiming to divest away from salmon farming and develop alternative and regenerative aquacultures, a network of restaurants was also established and each replaced farmed salmon with a climavore dish. And we had a food truck, a local bakery, pie shop, a bar, hotel, a Michelin star restaurant serving climavore dal soup, coca kelp climavore ice cream, Climb over kelp whiskey, twice dive climb over scallops, or climb over rope grown mussel nibbles. And for us, the restaurant is a very important space, and we tie it to the origins of the word restaurant itself, whereby uh, spaces in 19th century France were called bouillon restaurant, places where you could taste a soup to warm up the body. But today, we see the role of the restaurant as the space not only to restore the human body, but to restore uh, ecology at large. At the core of our project, an exhibition Salmon, a Red Herring for Tate Britain, this movement has expanded with Tate's removal of salmon off its menu across all of its cafes and restaurants across its four sites in perpetuity and the introduction of a climb of our menu instead. 
This consisted of seaweed-based dishes instead of farmed salmon, and also a new beer produced with Kulin Brewery in Sky that used oyster shells for carbonation and kelp in its brewing process. Further building on that, at the moment, more than 20 museums all across the UK have removed salmon off their menus and introduced a climb of our dish, such as the Serpentine, the Whitworth and Manchester Art Gallery, and many more. The project Becoming Climavore is also a, a way to, to use the space of the of, of cultural institutions and their restaurants and cafes to discuss these alternative aquacultures. Uh, so as part of the project, uh, they, we distributed these 12 types of postcards all across the country uh, that can be collected and turned into this poster, and also people can uh, learn more about how to become Climavore through uh, a website that can be used from the firm. So in parallel to all these UK-wide uh, move, um, the Climate Forestation in Sky is a coastal environmental heritage centre that we are running in Portree that acts as a catalyst to divest the island away from farmed salmon and promote regenerative aquacultures instead. And part of its educational mission is to secure traineeships and placements for local teenagers from the professional cooking school to train and become climb over cooks and get a placement in partner restaurants that remove salmon. Through pedagogical and professional development, the future cooks of the island can also start introducing that new coastal imaginary. The Climavore station also develops a host of new cultivation techniques for an intertidal polyculture farm, or Seacroft, that will host a multiplicity of species growing as an ecology. The replicable and scalable model can become a multi-site test, test site and a pedagogical space for coastal communities. After doing water surveys this month, we are making the first wild seeding test in Sky in collaboration with local marine biologists, testing different materials and textures for a seaweed to attach to them. From the waste streams that aggregate from consuming mussels and oyster shells, the climate forestation in Sky also is investigating new materials that are being developed to reduce the amount of food waste going to landfill. Instead, we are collecting shells from local restaurants that will be transformed into uh, new building materials and incorporated into the development of the climate forestation and the architectural fabric of the island. So we've made different kinds of prototypes thus far, and this also is connected to a global history of, of uses of waste shells in construction or different building typologies, from this uh, cement without cement in Taiwan that is made out of uh, shells, rice and sugar that we were uh, testing out as well, to uh, other prototypes that are, are kind of avoiding the use of cement and using um, like shell lime, like inspired by some of these techniques uh, in Scotland, um, but also expanding it to other materials from intertidal origin, um, like the ones used in Leso in Denmark, they use this in seagrass for roofing techniques, both historical and contemporary, or other uses of shells in, in China, for instance, uh, as materials for facades, or seaweeds used as um, ingredient for plastering outdoor walls in, in Japan. Through these many metabolic interactions, the tidal zone becomes a space of opportunity for discussing the spatial construction of the ocean and its shores. To rethink the coastal policy and facilitate small-scale independent initiative, the climb of our station works across education, farming, material, oral histories, and legal action, as it also provides advice on how to open your own oyster or seaweed farm, while supporting how to object planning applications that are trying to open or expand salmon farms. All of this while serving delicious climb of our dishes. So slowly, people coming up to Sky will ask for Sky kelp, Sky dolls, Sky oysters, or Sky mussels, ingredients that regenerate the coast by breathing in this era of increasingly evident mining-induced climatic events. On the tidal zone, we can determine what we eat as humans change climates. Thank you very much. <laughs>